Hello, welcome everybody. This is Dr. Terrence Duncan with Mahogany Thoughts and with my co-host Terrence Butler and the Queen Carmel Brown. She's illuminated in her queen chair in the background. Uh, welcome to the 20th episode of this particular podcast. The intent of the podcast is to provide uh, educational viewpoints as well as a normal conversation amongst Black entrepreneurs and other African Americans in the St. Louis community and beyond. And we want to try to provide our own voices on topics that are unique to us and, and provide our own perspective as well. And before we bring in our guest, uh, Butler, I see that you're finally back on the show, on time, on schedule, no basketball, no volleyball, short stories, you know, no we, Magnum 38, sitting there waiting for somebody, staring at your daughter, what's going on? Oh uh, yeah, just keep, just, keep it on, just keep it on my lap, that's all. <laughs> uh, but yeah, kids keeping me running, busy. Work keeping me running busy, so just left a basketball banquet. Gave, gave my daughter a nice little shout out, so it, it was all, it's all, uh, how did it go? Uh, you know, I'm here, you know, like I said, I just got, I say I'm always on a helicopter. I got to buy me a helicopter for real, though. That's, that's, that's really one of my goals to get, is to get an actual helicopter but to go back and forth. But right now, I have a uh, Chevy Malibu. That's my helicopter, but I want an actual helicopter for real. Absolutely. So look, so I know it's was, it was for your uh, daughter, who's a senior, right? Yes, sir. Did you hit the uh, Did you hit that slow tear? What did you say? Did you hit that slow tear? No, no, it, it ain't. All that ain't hit me yet. I'm, I'm, I keep moving. I don't have a t I don't have a chance to get emotional about nothing. Yeah, I feel you. It's because I'm on constant movement. So, son, about to start track. So. We'll see, but I think I think well I think the thing is too when she, she's only going to SIUE, I probably stay at home too, so we don't have that separation where I gotta kind of think about her going to the city type thing. So definitely understand, definitely understand. Queen Carmel, she is on staycation. Uh, her birthday is this week, I believe it's on the sixteenth, right? Fifteenth. Fifteenth. Okay, oh, tax day. Yeah. So when I pay my taxes, which I never pay on time. But when I do pay for my taxes and stuff, I have to think about you. When I file my extension on April the 15th, every year from now on, I'll think about you. There you go. Absolutely. Yeah, I'm I'm always like running at the end to get it done too. So we're in the same boat. October 15th at 4.59 p.m., one minute before the post office closed. That's when those taxes get in the mail. Sometimes I get a refund. The majority of times I don't. <laughs> That's why we don't rush to do it because we typically have to pay. So, you know, what's the rush, right? Oh, yeah. Nobody's rushing at all. <laughs> Absolutely. I'm going to have to give me a peep. Carmel, um, Carmel will, you, will you grace us with telling us how, how many years young you, you were going to be? Well, since you, you know, I always say you never ask a woman two things. You never ask a woman how much she weighs or how old she is. But since you asked and you're my co-host and I love you dearly, I'll let you know I'm 45. Oh, that's, that's a blessing. That's <laughs> good. Absolutely. That'll that's a blessing. Five a minute. Yeah, yeah. So is that lighting better? My daughter just gave me better lighting. Yeah, your lighting is better and stuff, but the way that the sun was hitting and stuff, it was kind of dope. Ah, maybe I should go back. Yeah, you could. You could. <laughs> well, before we bring in our guests, um, actually, I'll go ahead and bring them in real quick before we go through presentation time, sponsored by everybody that has a business here on this show. Um, we have Janet Westbrook and we have Dana Kelly and we have Devin Moody Graham. And so I know last episode, uh, for those who listened, we had talked about, you know, what was the current topic or what was going on in the news. And I think that's something that we should do uh, initially. So I, I think it's best to have our guests be able to chime in as well. And unfortunately, we had another shooting, another shooting of another African-American by a, a police officer. Um, you know, you say you get tired of talking about it, but it seems like we always get sucked in, unfortunately, by the actions of fools. And so um, I just, you know, I, I really get a chance to dive much into the story, be, and I really haven't as of late for a lot of them because they're very repetitive. Um, and Carmel, you said that you're turning 45. I'll be 45 in October. I mean, I still vividly remember Rodney King back in 1992. It is the same story you know, um, different variables, but the outcome is still the same and just no faith in the system in itself. And, you know, it's, you wish that it could stop. And I do remember seeing a post somewhere and I'm just gonna be flat out, and this is my belief, 
the criminal justice system was never designed to have equality. It, it, it never has been historically, whether it was in the United States or across the world, and it never will be. And so I, I think that we have to start coming up with more viable solutions to protect us from being in these situations. And I know it's like a big how, but it, it's at the point where, you know, it's like, I don't know how you can mistake a taser for a gun, you know, especially when they're two different, you know, sizes, shapes, and weights. But, you know, here we are again. So, you know, Jana, you're the first one that's on the Zoom panel as far as the scroll line. So what, I just want to get your thoughts and, and opinions on that. On that shooting? Yes, ma'am. You kind of froze up on me. Okay, we're gonna wait for her to come back on. But you, oh, you said you were uh, you're forty-five, almost forty-five. Can you yeah, let me know quick. that you can hear me? Okay. Uh, you yeah, kind of it's kind of static. You kind of in and out. We're gonna wait for her to get her connection back and stuff. Dana, um, just your comments on the, the current situation. You might have to mute her out, see. Um, yeah, maybe she can log out and log back in. And uh, have Butler chime in. Yeah, hey, Butler, can you text Jana and just tell her to uh, see if she can log out, log back in? Um, and check to make sure she, her device is connected to Wi Fi. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know what happened, but even her video had froze. Um, just a little round table. I mean, if you don't want to speak on it, that's fine. But I always think that it's it's always you know helpful for us to be able to speak on you know these topics on our own. You know, don't let the media paint the narrative. We should be able to have the discussion. So, um, Dana, your thoughts briefly on a matter or just just about the whole situation in general, the overall situation in general. On um, the young man, the most recent um, shooting of one of our young men. Yeah. Uh, my thoughts are. Um, it is, it is heartbreaking to constantly be in mourning. Um, my thoughts, you know, he is, my sons are 27 and 23 years old. And I remember thanking God that they made it to C-16 each time. And um, my thoughts are, if we don't unify swiftly and, 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 stay, and get on, um, the same messaging, the same accord, the same beat, the same step, uh, we will continue to mourn our youth. Absolutely. Well said. No doubt. Well said. Um, Devin? Yes. So my son is 16. And I mean, so just listening to Dana, and he turned 16 a few weeks ago. <laughs> and I have really tried not to look at the news too much because I realized that from last year and just years beyond, especially last year with the pandemic onsetting, I really had what I found out was called secondary, P as, we, as we all have, uh, secondary PTSD. And it, it got really bad to my insomnia, to me checking on my son all the time, checking on my kids, they're in the house with me now. Um, he's asking to go and I'm like, no, you know, even now it's, I can imagine, like I just wrote on this post um, on Instagram, I said, I can imagine and would never want to feel that unbearable pain to lose a child. So my thoughts and prayers are with his family. Um, I know he had, a, I think a, a daughter, um, you know, just, and my thing is, I'm tired of y'all thought. It was a post I found, let me, I found it on my Facebook. I found it on Instagram, but it said, I thought it was my taser, that's this time. I thought it was my apartment. I thought I, I saw him or her with the gun. Hmm. I thought he was selling Lucy's. I thought she was there alone. I thought she was getting smart with me. Their thinking equals terrorism for us. And I'm tired. Stop thawing. I'm I'm over it. I'm over it. Um, 
yeah so those are my thoughts i am going to tune in i'm definitely um just going to continue to pray for the family and look at i don't know other ways that i can help with as always with protesters i always contribute to like the bill um for the protesters in different places because that's not that's a way i can assist mm -hmm. but i'm tired um, my 16 year old is sitting in there and I wish somebody I don't wish anybody would because they don't want to see this this rain no pun intended look they don't want to see this this is crazy it's absolutely crazy and I I'm upset to say the least no doubt Bone. yeah I think I think it comes from it's, it's a fear that they have of, of us. I think it's, I think it's like a deep rooted one, a guilt from the way that slavery and racism. So I think they're, they're expecting us to always enact revenge. That's why they're so quick to pull the trigger it's because they're, they're kind of conditioned. Like, I know we treated y'all like some, you're going to look at me at the enemy. So I'm going to protect myself at all costs to get your life, to get your family, to get whoever else I'm protecting me because you have to see me as an enemy from the way that me and my people have treated you for centuries. So it's, it's that inherent fear they have. I think that's why she she probably did reach for her gun through the tank. Cause she was, I think she was literally scared of this 20 year old black man. I don't know how, I don't know how we get to see ourselves uh, to be undemonized by, by the police or by, by white people in general because the black people I know are some of the most kindless, gentlest people that I know, loving, caring, and everything. But we are seen as an enemy. We're seen as, as just monsters. And I think that's where that quick trigger comes from. And we, I don't know how to get past that point unless we, st we start somehow in action revenge. And I don't think they really want to see that side, but I think it's going to get to that boiling point. I think they're going to come across the wrong family is, is I think is, is what's going to happen. They're going to come across the wrong family. And I think that, I think hell is just going to break out if, if, it, if it continues. I don't see how it's going to stop because hopefully with the George Floyd thing that he's convicted and that kind of gives him a cause to pause when these things happen. But and hopefully she's convicted also, mistake or not. She, ha she has to face some kind of jail time for that. No doubt. Uh, Jana, um, your thoughts, and then Carmel, I know you're the, you're the therapist on the panel and stuff, and I just think it is really important for us to use this platform to voice our, our, our anger and our concerns again, and I just think it's really appropriate for you as a therapist just to remind the audience, you know, how to cope with this type of unfortunate cyclical grief and trauma again. Jana? Um, I, like, when whenever... I'm always reminded of like civil war time and how after civil war time that that was like such a great time for black people in America um, and how the entire time, you know, these, these however many years after the civil war when black people are actually for the first time ever um, sort of flourishing, um, there was underneath it all, there was, um, this entire plan and scheme to get things back to the way it was prior to the Civil War without it actually being um, illegal, if, if that makes sense. And I think now we just have the technology and the social media to shed light on something that has been prevalent for, for so long. Um, and, I, and I agree with what Butler said. It's like this inerrant fear. I don't think they know how to respond with people of color, black people especially being um, so informed. I don't think they, I, I do think that there's a guilt and their guilt, um, it, it manifests in fear um, of, of retaliation, of, um, of, of something that's un, un, unknown to us because as, as Butler said, we really, we are some of the, I mean, we're so cool. You know, we're some of, we're the nicest, most loving um, culture. Um, and I don't, they just don't know, they don't know what to do. They don't know how to respond. And I think the ugliness and the, the evil and the hatred that has been um, so deeply rooted and, and, and so just, I mean, it's just gruesome what they did throughout history. They're even realizing it. 
And it's just, and, and they don't know how to cope. I think they need more therapy. Uh, they don't, they don't know how to cope. They don't know how to cope with how disgusting um, their history is. And like I said, it, it ends up manifesting in fear um, uh, of us. Um, but but I, I'm very hopeful. I always try to um, be positive. I've been following like the Chauvin case, for example, and um, gosh, my, my heart breaks for the outcome just in case, just in case, you know, something don't happen right. I mean, it's looking good so far, but you just, you can't really shoot. I, I feel like we've, we've kind of lost a little bit of trust there, but that's, that's my, that's my. And I appreciate it. And there's no correct answer, you know, um, but again, I just think that all of us were highly talented individuals, we're entrepreneurs, we're business leaders, we're community yes. leaders. And I just think that in situations like this, we can't be silent. Um, I mean, we may not have all the answers, solutions, but we just can't be silent. And we're going to go back in the community and deal with all types of folks again. But, you know, you know, for the record and stuff, we're pissed, we're angry, and we're tired. You know, and our thoughts and prayers, not only for the family of this most recent tragedy and stuff, but for all the other ones and stuff that haven't even made the news or even that police officer or that, that, uh, the officer in the, in the military you know, with a video just got surfaced where he got spray, uh, uh, pepper sprayed at a gas station, you know, and, you know, it, it just, it has to stop. Carmel? Yeah, you know, there's so much that I want to say, and I'll try and keep it short. Uh, you know, first and foremost, my personal thoughts on it. Um, I know previously we, uh, it was mostly males, and we had to worry about our sons. I personally have a teenage son, and I have a daughter who's a young adult. And I'll tell you what, you know, with the whole Breonna Taylor situation and many other African-American females that have also uh, suffered uh, violence and some type of attack um, at the hands of law enforcement and other citizens as well as a result of their color um, and their race. And it's, we can't now only wor worry about our sons, we also have to worry about our daughters. And that's that's really sad. No other race of people has that problem, has that issue, has to worry about their children in that manner. Of course, all parents, no matter your race, have some concerns about your children being in the community and being, you know, walking about and driving about, but we have a different set of problems as African Americans and it perpetuates anxiety for African-American parents and their children. So when we have to pull our children to the side and have these discussions that the other kids, parents don't have to have with them, our kids leave home with a different level of anxiety than their peers do of other races. And that simply isn't fair, but it is our reality. And so being able to pay attention to our children and any uh, you know, symptoms or signs of anxiety that they may have, it could come out in different ways, but just making sure that if necessary, you get them a professional to see, you know, even if it's just for a couple of sessions, just to make sure they have a avenue or an outlet to verbalize any thoughts or fears that they might have. Um, and sometimes, believe it or not, our youth and young adults experience racism from their peers, but they ignore it. They don't talk to their parents about it. They don't know how to process it. And, and you know, just, you know, just at school, teenagers, them making a lot of jokes about racial issues and our children are made to laugh about it, you know, as it's a joke, they don't know how to process that. So, and sometimes they don't want to talk to the parents because they don't want the parents to dislike their friends and they don't want their parents to keep them home. So it, it's a whole set of, of issues that we deal with there. Now, something else I want to mention, Terrence, Dr. Duncan, you mentioned you said we're angry. You are absolutely right. We've been angry for quite some time. Unfortunately, that anger is misconstrued as aggressive and violent. And that anger with anger, typically it's a secondary emotion. Most often there's something else going on underneath that anger with African-Americans as it relates to race, that underlying stuff is things like fear. There's things like worry, panic, um, there's things like, uh, you know, sadness based on history. So it comes off as anger. And, you know, there's many of us who uh, try to remain professional, try to remain positive. We try to continue to keep other people uplifted in our community. But time after time after time, we keep hearing these same stories. And 
you know, even people that are trying to proceed in a positive manner and, and speak to it in a positive manner, you end up getting angry too over time. You, you just really can't avoid that. And so it's really important that we're careful about what we do with that anger, how we express that anger, who we express it to and how, and making sure that as a community, we are providing avenues for um, our adults and our children to be able to speak to the thoughts and the feelings and, and all those things that we deal with. Uh, one example is, yes. Okay. So, all right. So Terrence is saying, stop there. So I'm going to cut it. <laughs> you shouldn't have asked me. <laughs> well, actually, I mean, it's good that we had that stuff, but you know, like I said, I just wanted to be able to kind of touch up on it real quick because it was a current event and we do try to touch up on current events and also want to be mindful of the guest time yes. and also make sure that we stay on track. Cause I know that you know, uh, we can get very long-winded. And so I know that's not really the intent of this particular episode. So I do want to apologize for the quick little, no, no, no. So uh, before Butler takes it away, we're going to go over to Women in Entrepreneurship. This is the title of the particular uh, episode, the 20, 20th episode, 21st episode. And uh, our first guest uh, introduced, formally introduced is Mrs. Jana Westbrook. She is the founder and CEO of Provider Pool LLC. She is also the adjunct nursing instructor at Beck Area Career Center. She is a very talented individual. As she, uh, I've seen her her portraits and videos before. She does these acrylic portraits. I, I can't explain it, but they're pretty dope. You have to see it and stuff like she can take a picture and and just it's almost like an oil painting or something. Hopefully, she can explain that. I can't. But um, uh, her contact information uh, for those who are in the nursing industry. Um, she'll talk a little bit more about what she does and, you know, a way to be able to connect with her. And also there is her LinkedIn information. Our second guest is Mrs. Uh, Dana Kelly. She's the executive director of Women's March STL. She's the agency owner of the firm that deals with uh, insurance and financial services. And she's also the owner of Rain Restaurant that's on Washington Avenue. And for those who are just listening for uh, through the podcast only. It's 1122 Washington Ave, St. Louis, and the website is www.experiencebrain.com. Um, she has some really good uh, photos on Facebook and in her menu. I, I want to smash those shrimp and grits, and she got salmon croquettes. I'm a southern boy. I love salmon croquettes, so I, I'm looking forward to enjoying that. And our final guest is Ms. Devin Moody Graham. She's also she's the Chief Solutions Officer of CEO Mom Empire uh, LLC. She has worked with 500 plus businesses and over 15,000 youths on topics ranging from entrepreneurship as well as professional training. She has also served on select White House committees on technology and entrepreneur access. And she was also a finalist in the Score and Sam's Club Small Business Championship in 2018. And uh, her contact information is also provided on the slide, and she's on LinkedIn, and its uh, website is ceomomempire.com. And without further ado, Mr. Butler, this is uh, your show, and I would like for you to take it away. All good. Uh, definitely welcome, ladies. Uh, we're definitely blessed to have your presence on the show. Uh, we're the most dynamic female, well, not even female, just entrepreneurs I know in general. Uh, they have a wide range of talents and experience. So I was, when I was thinking about it, I was uh, trying to decide who, what direction I wanted to go because I'm, I'm an entrepreneur myself. So I said, I know last month was a uh, was it female, was it women's appreciation? What, what, what was last month? It was, uh, we, well, International Women's Day, International. but also Women's Month. It was the month of women. Gotcha, okay. I know we're I know we're a couple of weeks late, but uh, I definitely wanted to uh, still highlight you all in your businesses and say I salute you for everything you've done in our communities. And uh, we'll start out with Jana. Um, so provider pool, tell us about your baby pool and uh, how you should get froze again. I get froze. It's probably me. Like I have literally, I don't think I have very good service. Let me know that you can hear me. I can, we can hear you really well. It's scary this time to, on my side. But the signal All right. is. All right. Um, 
I'll just hop in. And then if, if you can't hear me, just give like a thumbs up or put it in the chat. Um, but yeah, so I'm Jana. And like you said, I'm the founder and CEO of Provider Pool. It's a tech company. It's a workforce management software company based in St. Louis, based in headquartered in downtown St. Louis. I'm a nurse by trade. And I've worked in healthcare for 12 years, primarily in healthcare administration. Um, and I wanted to create a way for hospitals to hire nurses on demand. So I ended up, had this crazy idea for a technology-based, app-based, on-demand hiring solution for healthcare organizations. Um, quit my job to work on it. And uh, I ended up joining T-Rex downtown St. Louis, a co-working space T-Rex. There was something called One Million Cups, which I think a lot of people are familiar with, One Million Cups on Wednesdays. Um, I just happened to stand up one Wednesday morning and present the company. It was the first time I, I didn't have like a, a product. I didn't really have a team or anything. I, I pitched it at One Million Cups and there just happened to be an investor in the audience um that investor ended up writing me my first hundred thousand dollar check and i subsequently raised um more venture capital i got some grant arch grants right there in st louis um grew the business and uh it's been super dope and now um now that i've been staffing nurses all over the midwest um i've learned a lot i've learned a lot about the workforce um especially in that 90 or 83 percent of registered nurses are white. But if you look at CNAs, which are sort of the lowest healthcare occupation there is, they are primarily minority. They're, they're mostly uh, black and brown people. And so um, this year I actually decided to help bridge that gap between the number of minority um, or the, the percent of minority CNAs that become nurses. I, I wanna um, help that. So we're currently working on um, in closing, we're currently working on an AI tool um, that helps to prevent the attrition of minority nursing stu students in higher ed. So I'm entering into the ed tech space. Uh, Dr. Duncan, we will be having some conversations here pretty soon. You know, I didn't know I could come back. Yeah, so, um, but that's me. So healthcare, ed tech, workforce innovation, those are all um, passions of mine. Amazing. And let's see. I wonder if he's still frozen. He's on um, mute right now. So, yeah. Hey, you know, Jenna, real quick and stuff. You mentioned T-Rex. For the audience who, who wants to know more about trying to build their brand and, and the uh, incubators and stuff, can you just a brief, you know, insight as to what T-Rex is, is about for those who might be wanting to know? Yeah, co-working spaces are, I think, Devin, are you still there? Um, co-working yeah. spaces are, are pretty hot. Like, obviously, if you have a business idea, I would hope that you're not just going to go get an office. Most people don't just go get an office and start paying rent. But a, a good way to just be in that startup field, be around people who are also hustling and working on their ventures, um, you can get a co-working membership where you pay monthly to go and work um, in a very... Um, startup like hustle environment and so t-rex is super affordable too i think when i when i first joined it was like 50 bucks a month i don't know if they've gone up at all but it was 50 bucks a month and um you get access to there's just about everything that you could need um in the building so marketing sales operations product tech development uh there's a venture capital firm upstairs there's arch grants downstairs um so i would plug them i plug them um all the time I'm at WeWork now, but I still plug T-Rex, so. Gotcha. Jenna, tell me about your creative side with, with, the, with the painting you do. When do you ever have, when do you yeah. ever find time to do that? <laughs> you know, it's crazy because I uh, never considered myself a painting. I can't even remember. I think it was like a bet or something. I, I, I bet somebody that I could paint something and uh painted something ended up paste or posting it on facebook and everybody was just like oh my gosh like what like where did you and i was like i don't know i guess you know it's crazy i don't even know 
I don't know how I did that. Um, and I started doing it and it actually became a creative outlet because anybody in the startup space knows that running a business, being an entrepreneur is not fun, it's stressful, sleepless nights. And so I really used it as like this creative outlet and it was super dope. But then like people started asking me to paint all kind of weird stuff and it wasn't as fun anymore. So, um, but I still do it. I still use my Instagram. Got you. What, what's the weirdest thing you've, you've ever been asked to paint? <laughs> um, that's one, that's one, other, one other show. <laughs> so, so somebody comes in my inbox and they're like, hey, do you do sensual paintings? And I was like, define sensual. <laughs> And I was like, no, I can't, I can't. This, this is too far, it's too much. Oh, Lord. Gotcha. <laughs> and you, you also sing, don't you? Only for the Lord. Only for the Lord. <laughs> Only for the Lord, all good. Let me just, I'm a preacher's kid. Let me just drop this right here. Pastor's kid. I gotta show you a cross off, okay. Gotcha. <clears throat> okay, we'll go over to Miss Kelly now. Uh, owner of rain restaurant um <laughs> tell us how, how you started with that with, with that baby and that and uh i guess your menu why you how you tied up your menu and how you decide you want to go into the restaurant business uh period and also kind of talk about the firm also okay so um i started my firm about 16 years ago and and the premise was just to make sure that we have financial literacy and someone that wasn't predatory in our community to speak with um, people that look like me. Um, I came up um, in the in corporate America um, from corporate finance, and and now uh, I mean, and when I seen everything that was kind of going on, redlining and stuff going on, I, th I said, well, I need to do this better, and I need to do it somewhere in our community um, where I can be as much of an as a help as possible. It wasn't being done. Um, as a matter of fact, they won't even. Uh, back when I started, they wouldn't even allow you to even get an agency in um, in the community I grew up in. They were saying it was just it was just bad business, and they weren't here for it. Um, but I said, no, I can do it. <laughs> and so, um, starting um, starting my firm over 16 years ago was uh, just the love for my melting pot of a community. I grew up in a um, a very diverse household and. I just always wanted to be able to do something. So uh, it, you know, went across in, uh, in my community. So that's one. Um, I also, uh, finance comes very easy to me. Um, and during, I, I want to say in my later 30s, I was like, I really want a bar. Like, I, I really like to, <laughs> I like to cook and entertain for my very close friends. And I just never really found the time. And um, in the last couple of years, God blessed me with um, connections and opportunities that were bigger than I could have ever imagined. And, um, and that is what birthed rain. Um, I travel a lot and have traveled a lot throughout my corporate career and, and throughout uh, my financial literacy um, being excited about finance for the youth throughout the years and stuff like that. I travel a lot and I have all my great and like my favorite places that I go to whenever I'm out of town. And I'm like, man, we really need this at home, you know? And, and I just could never see anybody bringing it there, bringing it home. And then I thought, why can't I, you know? So, and I just, and I have, um, I have wonderful people in my life who, who thought the same thing that St. Louis deserves what the things that we travel out of town to receive. And so it was, it was amazing cultivating. Um, and you asked about the menu. Uh, it took a, a lot of uh, visits to, um, I, I want to say I probably, there was probably more than 50 people that cooked for me. Um, I probably gained about 30 pounds throughout that process. Uh, it was very important to me that we had um, someone that could cook Maryland style crab cakes. Um, and in the story that everyone would say is like, please get her crab cakes right. Otherwise we just have to leave. There's no point in being here if you don't get those crab cakes right. 
Um, but um, but yeah, so just visiting as many chefs as possible. Um, of course, I was going for you know chefs of color. I really wanted to find a woman chef of color <laughs> and and just kill it in the food thing. There's no reason that we can't uh, serve the best food in the city, also and have the best venue in the city of St. Louis. And that was what I that was that was what I aimed to do. And I feel like we hit the mark. Yeah, so we, see, we, we definitely got to hit up Rain and check it out. I've been saying I'm going to go by there and go by there, but you know, with the COVID and whatnot. There is something that we, um, we talked about and I didn't really get to address it because, um, but it kind of goes on with the, with the very first thing that we talked about. Um, Washington Avenue is a big deal for a person of color. I, I happen to be the only um, black woman owned business on Washington Avenue. <laughs> And um, there's a lot of people, non-persons of color that are petitioning so that I don't exist anymore. And um, I think that this is the be this type of stuff happening in the background and persons like myself fighting it and not talking about it is what the end result is what we end up seeing. And when you don't give people an opportunity to help you uh, fight in this way, um, we'll, we'll lose something as beautiful and as big um, for us because I didn't say anything. And so I'm making sure to speak up. Okay, so tell me more about this petition. So there's, there's literally a petition to stop you from having a business on Washington Avenue? Literally a petition being, um, circulated by a group of non-white individuals that have referred to non-white non non sorry non persons of color okay individuals um i was gonna say all white but they not all. <laughs> but non-persons of color um individuals that are um are saying that my prop my business my restaurant is a nuisance and they, it's bringing and attracting the type of people that they aren't wa wanting in their community. Wow. Um, and realistically, like the realist, the real part of this is we've never had any issues. Um, they've used COVID in the city to, to fight their, their fight. We haven't had any COVID issues that led back to our restaurant. Um, but we have been attacked. We've been under attack since we opened our doors. The real of this is we, I opened my doors on August 1st and, um, and here we are in April. So right around eight months later and realistically um, in six months time, 180 days, my restaurant was closed for 130 of those. Wow. And I think, again, if I don't say anything, people don't know, hey, we have a fight on our hands. The, at the end of the day, they've removed a lot of people of color in business on Washington Avenue from down there using language like we just want people safe. We don't want any more um, people dying on Washington. We don't want any more shootouts. We're tired of the car street racing as if the only cause of violence and street racing is are the black businesses. And uh, realistically, I've been down there, like I said, I opened on August 1st and there was plenty of crime before I got down there. <laughs> plenty oh, of crime before my uh, restaurant opened. And um, yeah, and so there, there's just a lot I can say, but I'm not gonna take up a whole lot of that time. And But people don't know that this is a fight that I am right now in. And I think it's important that people in our community and even outside of our community understand that I own one of the biggest businesses in our city, in our state, and they are trying to end that. And so I think that's important for people that look like me to know. If they- well, how, how big is your staff right now, roughly? Um, I have a, around 79 employees. Wow, that's right awesome. And the fact that, and again, that does speaks to the other thing that the city cares more about a person that looks like me not being in business than they care about almost 80 people being employed. That, that's, that's a big deal. Absolutely. Man, that's, 
It looks like that, um, but I know you talked about, you know, probably checking it out and stuff. And I know we talked about going live on location. Carmel, I think that, you know, I think the three of us might as well go live on location there and we'll film our, you know, we can film a live show from there. You know, oh, yeah. Make, 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 it a, make it a brunch meeting. Yeah. Make it a brunch meeting. <laughs> yeah, make it a brunch meeting. No, absolutely. Make sure we do that. Make sure we record it. And, you know, we, and we just tell the truth. We speak our truths because otherwise, you know, they have more people trying to silence you than you have more people trying to pub you up. So, you know, maybe we can try to do a little bit of uh, our part in being able to support you and your business and stuff. And I'll be there very shortly because I want that Sam Coquette. Get that Sam Coquette. Yes. <laughs> well, good. I look forward. Make sure to let me know when you come. Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. And last but not least, Miss Moody Graham. Uh, hey, hey, hey. Good evening. I know you've been in business since you were in diapers probably uh, man it feels like it i know right it feels like it i've been writing checks for my dad's business since i was eight so i've been in in this game for quite a while with the family business too so okay well t tell us your story even from then uh seeing your dad being an entrepreneur to uh to where you are now with uh ceo mom empire Yes, so I've uh, been a professional I guess, entrepreneur or an adult entrepreneur for the last 12 years in business strategy and business development um, with the focus on minority-owned businesses. Uh, I've done commercial development, uh, do a lot of assistance with micro-businesses, um, just meaning smaller entities uh, that are starting up, helping them to, collect to res connect to resources, um, I've had a passion for business in general in my whole life. I am the product of a cobbler, AKA shoe repairman and a cosmetologist. Um, and Terry, of course, is our insurance guy. <laughs> we always gotta look, we gotta, we gotta keep everything in the family. Um, and so I've always loved um, Supporting our businesses and what I found, even with my dad's business, Broadway Shoe Repair, 308 North Broadway, downtown St. Louis. Um, he was actually just featured in the St. Louis Business Journal. And I'm saying that because he is he's he learned to become a cobbler almost 60 years ago at Hadley Tech, which no longer is around. It was near what Vashon is. And that is a dying art. But my dad was in the same boat being a sole proprietor um, with knowing what he knew, but not really knowing how to grow and scale the business. Um, so many times, especially as minority businesses, we have, we know our craft, be it something in food, be it in beauty, be it whatever it is, but not having that foundation. So like, even when this pandemic money came around, people trying to get documents and stuff together to take advantage of it. So that's why I'm in the business I'm in. Um, I am moving more towards more corporate pieces. And I started doing some online training because of capacity. But um, from there is where CEO Mom Empire started um, because I am a mom and um, that is my life. And so I tend to work with more, more women and tend to work with more women with children. And I want it. I know that I own it and I wanted other women to own it and not feel like they have to wait to do what it is that they want to do, to wait to do things. I mean, I planned an international conference with the infant and nobody was going to guilt me or make me feel like I couldn't do it just because I was a mom and I have multiple children and whatever, you know? So it's really about no matter what your life circumstances are, if you have a dream, I believe that you should do it. You know, you put those resources together and do it, so yeah. That's me. Gosh, okay. Awesome, awesome. So, ladies, I'm, I'm not sure if all of you were there. I know Jana was there. I'm not sure if Dana was there, but the, Jana, you started a photo shoot downtown St. Louis for uh, for female entrepreneurs. T tell me about how that experience went and where you got the idea of doing that. Yeah, I uh, when the article came out, there was an article that was that was out that mentioned how St. Louis. Um, had the most women entrepreneurs. And I remember, you know, when something cool happens, you always want to take a picture. Uh, when our food come in the restaurant, we take a picture, you know, photo op. Um, and so I was like, this would be really, really cool for the world to see. And I originally thought that um, maybe 50, maybe 60 um, women, women would come out 
and I wanted a drone. And this is before I knew I needed like clearance to have a drone at a national monument. Um, but I was like, let's just get everybody together underneath the arch and just snap a photo and then get out of there. Um, but I didn't have any. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry to interrupt. That's where I met you. I was looking this whole time. Go ahead. Yeah. That. Um. So. I had the idea, didn't have any pool. First of all, nobody knew who I was, you know? And so it wasn't like I had access to the women, um, but I was in T-Rex, another, another plug. And somebody told me to reach out to Maxine Clark. And this is how green I was to entrepreneurship. I didn't know who she was. I didn't know she was the, um, the former CEO and founder of Build-A-Bear. And so I think that's why Maxine and I are so close is because I didn't ask her for anything. I didn't like pitch her for money or anything, but I hit her up and I was like, hey, Maxine, I want to, I don't, I don't know you, you don't know me, but I want to celebrate women entrepreneurship in St. Louis. And I'm trying to get more women to come. Can you help me spread the word? And um, she reached out, she reached out to a couple of news outlets. I ended up being on the news that morning and we had like maybe 3000 um, RSVPs. It was crazy. And so- wow. Um, yeah, that day, I think we had 22 people who are 2200 people who ended up coming. And it was just so epic. I was just like, Oh, my gosh, look at all of these incredible women. And uh, you could have, there were so many women doing so many incredible things. I was just blown away um, at the talent and the um, just the hustle and the grind and the innovation and the passion that was represented there in all of those women. And once I got into the venture capital space, once I got into like fundraising for my own business, I was just like, man, if these dollars could be invested into these women, like we would literally change them and understand how beneficial it would be. Um, but yeah, I still have the photos. I think we're going on like, that was like two years ago now, but it seems like just yesterday, so. That is awesome to go from a projected 50 in your mind to going to 2200. Yeah. That, yeah. I remember reading about that. I was like, so look at Jay out there doing that thing. That's, <laughs> that's, that's awesome. Um, next question either one of you can answer. Um, what was your biggest struggle in entrepreneurship and how did you overcome it? Um, for me, I would say finding someone that looked like me that was doing what I thought I wanted to do at the time. Um, because of course I know that uh, women of color exist as consultants, but I mean, I was starting out in 2008, like Google was still a little shaky. Um, I think LinkedIn was around, but it wasn't like, I, I had met someone on LinkedIn who, was, who I still haven't met who sent me resources, but I didn't really know. I wanted to work in business development and marketing strategy with me starting things out. And the people that I was meeting or people were telling me they were all white men. And I take information from anybody, but it's when you don't have anyone that looks like you where you feel comfortable to tell them your fears and tell you what you're afraid, you know, what you're afraid of, or just really have those candid conversations, it does change how fast and how quickly you grow. Like I really applaud the, I mean, it's not like I'm old, but the women who are like 10 and 15 years, my junior who get to see who they consider me an auntie. I'm like, who am I auntie already? But you know, who see people do things that they they can move faster. And I want them to move faster and make money and make all the moves. But when you see that, you can move faster. And the industry that I was in at the time around this area, it was mostly white men that people were trying to introduce me to. And I'm like, yeah, that's great. I remember even being told by this one white millionaire who had a medical equipment uh, company. He was like, yeah, you're brilliant. I want the dollars to match. I don't need you to keep telling me I'm brilliant. You know what I mean? So there's there's a whole nother thing with the wealth gap. But so for, for me, it was, I had to create a path because there wasn't a path there. And later I ended up connecting with someone who's here now. So one of my mentors is uh, Brownwin Morgan. She's originally from East St. Louis, but she moved to Atlanta after graduating from U of I. That's where I went to college and I met her at an alumni event. And so she sent me my first contract. She said, I always get it in writing. She, I still have the contract template that she sent me. She sent me some a couple things and then we reconnected a few years later. And now she's back here in the area. She's also a T-Rex and she's in the geospatial 
space doing it, STEM space doing some great things uh, with Zio Air. But saying that to say, when you don't see people that look like you that are doing things, it does make it more difficult. So that's why I've always kind of been the first to do certain things. And I just jump out there and do it because I, I don't see it out there to connect. And so, cause I'm all about collaboration, but if I don't see it, I create it. So that was what it was for me, not knowing anybody in this space of consulting and really like doing commercial development. When I did grocery store development, there was no other black women doing that. That was in my early twenties when I opened my first, helped open the first grocery store, the Save a Lot store in uh, East St. Louis. I just did research, you know, and wanted to do it. So, but there was no real big blueprint because there was usually big companies doing that development. So. Uh, <clears throat> like, uh, like Devin, I was, I was in corporate finance and went into, went from a predominantly white um, field or, or, you know, just where I've never seen anybody that looked like me. And the reason I went into business for myself was a little different. I had never even looked or thought that I would be an entrepreneur. Um, I went into business for myself for my son, who is my 27 year old now, um, but my son at the time, he, and he is special needs. He's learning delayed. And um, I had worked for the first black person I ever worked for in my life. And uh, she was very, um, she, she, was, she wasn't malleable when it came to me being a parent of a special needs child. And so I had to make a decision to be, to go out and give as much time into my own business where I was making millions of dollars for these other people <laughs> to go into business for myself so that I can be the mother that I needed to be to my child. Um, so he could surpass all of the, um, he could surpass every last space they said he would, he would stop at, every dead end they gave him, which was not learning past seventh grade level and not living even past 19. And, um, and so my, my reason for going into entrepreneurship was different and, and I think added a little bit more difficulty to it because I wasn't going out there as a black woman. I was going out there as a mother who was, you know, really trying to uh, advocate and be present for her child. So, but like Devin said, coming from a predominantly white field, it was pretty, it was a, a complete 180 that had to be done, <laughs> so. That was one of the most difficult way. That was one of the most difficult things that I had to go through in going into business for myself, and and that was the choice, and not having like the the complete plan, just the plan of being a mother. Gosh, you just. I think with entrepreneurship, uh, it's it's like you all found your why. You know, we all we all have our why, which is our motivation when we have our bad days, because I know. I can almost guarantee 100% of the time there were times you wanted to quit throwing the towel, so this is not for me. And then you go back to your why, get refueled up, so now we got to keep pushing because I still see the vision. So tr trust me, trust me, I get it. Uh, anyone else? Dr. T, Cuomo, have any questions? Well, you know, um, I wanted to ask. Uh, Karma a question because I know that she has a business. Um, she's an entrepreneur. She's a therapist and also she has a gym. And I know that she's not originally from the area. Uh, I think she's from Mount Vernon, if I believe. And just, you know, some of the challenges even coming to Belleville because there's not a lot of black owned businesses in Belleville. And um, you kind of look at the dichotomy between, or actually there isn't that too much of a difference between uh, both sides of the river and stuff when you look at, uh, you know, some of the racial challenges for, you know, black businesses. So, you know, Carmen, what do you think are some of the challenges that you have as far as maintaining your business and just, you know, trying to maintain that quote unquote same level of respect um, that's probably given to white peers, your white peers or even white men? Well, you know, to be honest with you, I haven't had uh, any issues in that area, especially with my therapy practice. Um, you know, it's pretty uh, well-rounded with regards to race. 
um, having, uh, you know, I deal with the insurance companies mostly with that. So not necessarily the city, but I can say that uh, city of Belleville, when you talk about building codes and things like that, there was a lot of difficulty up front with, you know, electric, electrical things, plumbing things, um, and then wanting you to undo work that you've paid someone to do. And there's a lot of hoops to jump through to get things going code wise in Belleville. But for the most part, you know, there hasn't been anything uh, critical that I haven't heard other businesses say that they've experienced. The other question I have, and Karma, I'll let you, uh, you know, piggyback with questions as well. Um, Jana, I know that you have mentioned about stress and sleep, and I think that a lot of people, they, they look at the glory of entrepreneurship, they see the posts, they see the pictures, they see, you know, the smiling and stuff, but they don't see a lot of the pain and the stress and ladies, I know that all, or actually all of us can probably relate to that. Um, you know, how did you manage to kind of overcome that stress and, and be able to try to find yourself centered, you know, day to day, um, especially on days when you feel like that, you know, maybe this might not be the thing for me. Yeah, 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 yeah for sure. I think um, for me, um, ha like ha having a board, having investors, it's like you're always working towards something, you know, you're always, there's a KPI that you're needing there, you know, there's some milestone, some benchmark. And so when you're hitting things, when you're hitting milestones, when you're achieving things, there's something else right after it that you got to hit. And honestly, that next thing is probably going to be harder. If you're growing 10% month over month, um, and you're doing that consistently, the the idea is that now you're going to be growing 20% month over month and then 100% month over month growth. And so not celebrating along the way, not acknowledging, um, you know, that you are hitting those milestones or that you are actually doing something really starts to wear on you. And then you start to feel like it's not really worth it because you haven't really been able to enjoy anything along the way it's just like I'm constantly working towards something and so I had to consciously tell myself um to celebrate number one celebrate the win a acknowledge the work that's being done acknowledge the fact that you are making steps regardless of the the size of the steps or even how long it took you to get there just acknowledging that you're making progress and even celebrating, just taking some time to be like, oh, I hit it this month. The numbers, rewarding yourself, even just doing something small to reward yourself. I love just the just being in the weeds um, and not seeing the forest for the trees or the trees for the forest or whatever that saying is. Um, but that that made a big difference when I was like, no, this is dope. Like, this is dope that I just that I just hit this hit this milestone. You know, I would encourage anyone to do that. Carmel, do you have any uh, particular guests? Or not guests. Do you have any uh, can't even talk particular questions for the guests? No, no particular questions. I'm just listening and enjoying all of this uh, great experience I'm hearing from the panel. Absolutely. Um, go ahead, Bubba. No, I was just going to uh, ask a question to the panel. Um, because my, my I have a daughter. Uh, she's 18. She has an online business. Uh, where she makes um, these binders, like these budget binders by hand. And uh, I think her biggest month, I think one of them, I want to say she made about 3000 one month. She's doing that stuff by hand and also uh, going to school and being an athlete or whatever. And uh, she's going to school for pharmacy. But I think she also has a passion for business. Uh, so for I can call her a woman. I she just turned 18. Uh, women, I can't believe I just said my daughter's a woman. <laughs> but uh, for young women uh, who have entrepreneurial aspirations, what's the, uh, the best advice um, that you can give them starting out young? And um, any one of you can answer or all that yeah. you would give a young, a young woman looking to get into the business world. I say this to my youth all the time because I have a lot. I mentor in groups to young uh, women. Um, tap into every resource. I wish when I started out that I reached out more and utilized the, the people in my life who had already 
you know, banged their knees against the, the mountains and, you know, did everything. <laughs> I wish that I would have reached out more and utilized them as a, a full on resource when I went into business. Um, I think that that is something in our culture that we, we are too proud to, to say where we need it, how we need it. Um, but that is, that's the advice I always give to my youthpreneurs, um, young, uh, young men and women utilize your surroundings, your any resources you have in your um, and your parents, you know, utilize any resource that you have. That's one of the things that I would say. I mean, I agree uh, definitely with that. Also ask questions, um, but even before asking questions to people that are doing something that you wanna do or that you, even if you haven't started the venture, um, what are your goals? Like, are you doing this to raise money because you want to buy a pair of shoes? Are you doing it to pay for a trip? You know, um, are you doing this just to see if you could do it? A lot of times, I mean, I know for me, I've done a lot of different things for a lot of different reasons. And so, and having a, having children that have their own businesses, I have learned to try to step back some because once they start doing it, mama's like, okay, what are we doing? What's the next level? Okay, we're going to do this. We're doing it, you know? And so try not to push them too much because then sometimes they may or may not want to continue doing it when we add that added pressure, as people say, as a, a momager or whatever. But um, finding out why they're doing it, you know, it may just be something that they're doing for a brief time, or it may be something that they want to continue doing it. But once they identify what those goals are, then it's easier to find out who they should talk to, you know, maybe if they want to have a just an informal conversation with someone who's in that can that's been doing things in budgeting, if they should connect with someone who's doing it on a big, you know, she should connect with someone who's doing it on a larger scale. So but really find out what the goals are, and to see how long she wants to do it, how interested if she wants to do a continue going into college, then looking at maybe her friends to be to help with fulfilling these orders so she can spend her time. You know, that could be a little side money for them as well. So I'm good with building those teams and stuff. And, you know, you can ask me something offline too to assist her as well. All good. Definitely take you up on that. Okay, anybody else? Yeah, and I'll try to, in like 30 seconds, um, I would say think bigger, um, think bigger. We, we naturally think um, a little bit smaller, I would say in comparison with other uh, people, other types of uh, entrepreneurs, especially women in general. And so I would say, take your idea um, and then go a hundred times greater. Think how you can make an impact globally and then work backwards from there. Don't try to be a household name in Belleville or in Illinois or in the Midwest. Think big because there are people who have um, much more mediocre ideas um, out here doing, you know, raising big, big venture capital checks and making a splash when I bet your daughter is way more talented and creative. So my um, advice would be like, think to the point where it makes you uncomfortable and then work backwards from there. Gotcha. Yeah, that was myself. <laughs> Most definitely. Well, I believe we're about to end up uh, wrapping up this uh, this episode, I believe. I know it's, it's getting close to the time. Um, any other closing comments, um, questions for, from the, uh, for the panel? No, um, in the end, I just think that, you know, I'm very grateful for the, the guests that came on tonight and for the guests that we have every night, you know, beforehand and afterwards. And it takes a team, you know, and, you know, Jenna just said something to the kind of made me think about it. You know, it, the support that you have is really invaluable. And, you know, and even the situation where Dana was talking about um, with her restaurant, it, 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 we have to support each other and we can't continue to attack each other and tear each other down. I mean, because, you know, we're already, you know, seems like they were backpedaling a lot of times and stuff when you think about it from a law enforcement perspective, or if you look at it from educational racial wealth disparity gaps, I think it's really important stuff that we continue to maintain contact amongst each other so we can feel how, figure out how to build each other's brands collectively. And like I said, think bigger than St. Louis, think bigger than Belleville or Fallon or, or whatever the case may be. You know, when this particular concept started, uh, the Mahogany Thoughts, you know, it, it started off with just a little you know, random thought in my head and, you know, just to be able to build a team with, um, you know, Queen Carmel and, and, um, and Mr. Butler, 
you know, just to see that growth, you know, over time, it's just really, you know, sometimes I take a step back and just be in awe, you know, for the support they have and just, you know, the, the individuals that we met, you know, Devin, Dana's first time I met you, I'm going to support you guys to the fullest and, you know, and, and vice versa and just be able to draw on those connections and just also have a platform. You know, we have to continue to have our platforms because, you know, if Dana never was on the show, I never would have known what was going on. You know, we, you know, we kind of hear those rumors and grumblings of, you know, some of the challenges of black business and what they go through, which is really unfortunate because St. Louis is the largest, it's actually one of the fastest startup locations in the country for African-American women. And despite that moniker, we have a black owned business that's on one of the more thriving, you know, business districts who's about to, you know, that's encountering a lot of resistance to, so they can try to run out of town. And so we have to continue to just keep fighting and just keep supporting and, you know, and, and just put our feelings aside from time to time and stuff and just realize the stuff that we're better together, you know, than we are apart. And so um, most, the most humble gratitude as always ladies for, uh, you know, jumping on and uh, hopefully we have you guys on at various points throughout the show in the future. And that's basically all I have to say, you know, on that one, um, you know, Butler, if, I don't know, Carmel, if you have any other comments, you know, we can go ahead and wrap that up. No, once I, just like you, I, once again, I just want to say thanks to the panel for joining us this evening. You guys have been, been great. You've given some great information and I'm sure everyone that's listening, I hope everyone that's listening is taking notes. Likewise, uh, we're definitely humbled. We're honored uh, to have definitely Black excellence on the panel. All of you are uh, definitely rock stars in your own in your own businesses and whatnot. Great role models for men and women to model their businesses after. Um, so we we definitely salute you, and we wish you all the success in the world. And Dana, we will definitely be hitting up Rain very soon. Absolutely, absolutely. Well, that'll wrap up our uh, show for um, April the 13th. I know next week we have uh, Mr. and Mrs. Smith, D'Angelo and Krista Smith with Mike Hobbs. Um, They are in Atlanta, but they actually bought a franchise to provide business lending to help with um, their business model. I mean, ob obviously outside of profitability is to try to help uh, improve access uh, of capital to black businesses. So uh, we're really looking forward to having them on board. And, um, you know, we have like three, four more weeks left of uh, recording. You know, we'll have a nice little break. But um, this is Dr. Duncan with Mahogany Thoughts with the co-host, Queen Carmel Brown, in her magical chair, as well as Mr. Butler. And uh, we are out. Peace.